Welcome to Ask the Author with Nisha Dolan as part of Ennis Book Club Festival 2021. My name is Danny. I'm the Artistic Director of the festival and thank you for joining us. This event is free, but if you'd like to make a donation to the festival, you can through the donations page of our website. Thank you. Hi Nisha, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. No worries, lovely to have you and thanks for doing this event for Ennis Book Club Festival. So your format, your chosen format this year was to do uh, Ask the Author and I really liked that because I thought it was kind of fun to open it up and let people ask you things. So we have a mix, a diverse mix of things. So I'm going to just jump into them and let's let's see how we get on. Where is your favourite place to go to in London? I think the libraries, it's just amazing to me how many great ones are completely free and it's a lovely atmosphere. There's no pressure to get anything done. Like I hated the library in university because you felt like you were dragging the standards down if you went there and didn't do anything. But London ones, you can just kind of sit and soak it up. <laughs> when did you join a library when you were a child? Like, was that a thing in your childhood, the library? Uh, yeah, there was a local one that was very good, um, especially on the classics. So I ended up reading a lot of them. Also, the Babysitter's Club, they just had like easily 30 of those and I got through them all. Yeah. Um, Ennis, I suppose, celebrates reading particularly and we're kind of closely linked with the library service and support that idea of like everybody reading. But I joined the library when I was five as well. And I, I always think it's just such a great resource now for people that is still probably a bit underused. You know, it's like free books for everyone. Why wouldn't you go? Yeah, completely. Um, someone wants to know, where is your next novel set? London. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like a plant. So I just uh, adapt to my environment. So probably wherever I am when I'm writing something will be where it will be set. Okay, cool. Um, what is your relationship with social media like? I'm complicated, I guess. It's really something that I'm still figuring out because, you know, you grow up with the idea that it's just a place to be yourself and see what your friends are up to. But then whether or not that's how I still see it, they are for all intents and purposes professional accounts now. And if I just keep posting completely me, that will still be treated as professional statements about me and my work. And I don't want that. So it's, it's still a bit confusing and something I'm thinking about. Yeah, I think that's, I suppose, yeah, the private and the public. Because like you say, I, I guess even on Instagram, some people have their accounts public or private. Is your Instagram, is your Instagram account private or public? public yeah. yeah mine is too and sometimes I wonder about that because I just I guess I left it that way not really thinking about it but um yeah some people then I notice now when I follow someone who's a private account or when it goes in it's like a it's a, a choice I guess obviously that they're making yeah I don't know I like I suppose I believe in access or I like that idea of access but um three people you would like to have dinner with Oh gosh, I, I think I don't like having dinner with people in general because I'm profoundly dyspraxic. So it's just this constant stressful thing of like, how do I not drop my spaghetti? So I would never want to have dinner with anyone I found impressive because my motor skills would just kill any idea that they had of me as an intellectual. But um, if I were to rephrase it as people I would like to hang out with in some lower pressure setting where I was not going to spill things on my clothes. Um, <laughs> obviously Oscar Wilde would be great crack. I'd love to hear more about his life I, I feel like there was a version of him that didn't make it to public scrutiny and maybe with enough booze I could like get it out of him um Zora Neale Hurston similarly she was just such a glamorous lady and I could like soak that up and try to emulate it and okay someone who's still alive Ooh, I, I just really want to get to know my brother right now and I can't because he's in Dublin and I'm in London oh. so yeah my brother so Neil Hurston's a really interesting choice, actually. Um, I love Their Eyes Were Watching God. I love that book. I read it in college and it just stayed with me. And I think Sadie Smith did a, an introduction. Yeah, to yeah it. I read that one too. Yeah. And it's, and it's really good. It's, it's really interesting. Um, yeah, I, I would just read Sadie Smith on any other author. I think she's, well, she's not a better critic than a writer because she's the perfect writer, but she's also such an excellent critic. She is. She's a brilliant critic. I totally agree. And I, I really enjoy 
um, those pieces that she writes, that one in particular, because it's nice also to see the relationship, I guess, that a writer has to another writer and um, what they have to say about the work, because we do appreciate the work in very different ways through very different kind of angles. And I think sometimes it's interesting to see like, who does the introductions to those books and why are they asked? Because sometimes it's like, ooh, very interesting, like astute choice. And then other times, you know, you kind of want to just skip ahead and get into the book, but not not when it's Sadie. Yeah, yeah, completely. That value add for sure. The only person who can add value to Zoe Neil Hurston. <laughs> um, what do you do to clear your head? Oh gosh, well, whatever I do, it's not working. But um, what I try to do is, I suppose, do things where it's not a cognitive effort like I love watering my plants because it's the dumbest possible task I still fuck it up but it's a dumb task that I can just you know turn the head off for a bit so just kinesthetic stuff like that being with nature as much as you can in London walks for similar reasons how long have you been in London and um, so that's a complicated and um, I first moved to London in 2018 and I've kind of been on and off since then, but um, most recently since between the first and the second lockdown, because I didn't have anywhere long term to stay during the first one, so I just came back to my parents, but okay. now I've finagled a long term rental thing. Okay. Um, I know you mentioned your plants and you've been hanging things in your apartment in the last week. Someone did actually ask a practical question that you may have already answered about what you used to hang the pictures, but maybe you can say what the pictures are and and yeah, if you can answer that question within the context of that, great. Yeah, sure. So um, there's one of them above me there. So what I did was I just um, got prints of some of my favorite 19th century art because it, I just want things around me that remind me of the literature that I studied most intensely and yeah it's just nice to have so I put those in frames and then the way I hung them was with a wire hanging kit so like you put screws into them tie the wire around the screws and then you put it on top of a hanging hook so like that's possible because my room has a picture rail I think if you don't have one you have to drive screws into the wall which landlords tend to hate but I think there are ways around it going away from DIY and and plants and into a kind of a literary question what oh are gosh <laughs> is that what I'm here to do <laughs> <laughs> here I thought I was interiors gal <laughs> we might come back into some of those at a, at a later point but um I think this is a, a bit of a hard question. I, I would struggle to answer these kinds of questions when you're a writer about favorite books and stuff like that, you know, because there's so many. And but I guess there's two questions, one relating to um, books in the past year and then books in general. So the first question is no pressure. What are the best three novels you have read in the past 10 months? 10 months? <laughs> But, oh, I suppose because we're in March, so that makes sense in terms of encompassing. No, wait. <laughs> anyway, here's me analyzing okay, so my 10 months. Yeah. Well, um, I would so say I'm just going to advise because, like, I totally get, like, I think this is a hard question to answer, especially when you're a writer, right? So, what I would say is, you know, it's obviously probably a question about maybe even lockdown and what you've read. So, things you've maybe read in the last 10 months that you've enjoyed let's say that right yeah um I really loved real life by Brandon Taylor it was shortlisted for the Booker Prize and it's a campus novel about a young queer black man in gosh I, I don't think it's ever named but I am a fairly anonymous U.S. university and the style is very wolfy and so it's this sensory delight it's the complete opposite of my writing style every possible detail is there and I love that because I think it's really good for you as a writer to read someone else doing very well something that's not necessarily in your toolkit and it, it's also just a lot of fun there's a brilliant dinner party scene cool great oh, uh, and two more two more <laughs> um two more let's see um Breast and Eggs by Mieko Kawakami. It's 
set in Tokyo and Osaka and it's translated from Japanese with Dagothia from Picador and I, it's hard to pin down what it is about her style that's so engrossing because like Brandon Taylor she's got this incredible level of detail but it, it's maybe more selectively placed and uh, there's this, just this brilliant moment near the start where women are discussing breast implants and it's just this like snappy dialogue that you can hear just rolling out but at the same time the scene is treated with such intellectual seriousness and she just seems like an enormously clever writer and then third of all Cleanness by Garth Greenwell that book absolutely wrecked me so it's in some ways a follow-on from his debut but it's completely self-contained and it's about gay sex in Europe so I'm there um, and it's also just a, a complete emotional roller coaster and he has the most perfect rolling sentence which again is something I'm not into you won't really catch me writing a sentence that's longer than like three lines most of the time but he does it so well and it's really conversational and just gets into you it's just an incredible style some exciting time specific questions so um this one is exciting times has been incredibly successful when did you first realize that this was about to happen or happening and what was your reaction um there's a bold assumption in that question that i have processed any of this yet. <laughs> i don't think anyone's processed anything that happened to them in 2020 <laughs> It, yeah no I just um I, I mean I think you need boundaries around that kind of thing to keep writing so mm. it's just not something that I think about and that's not because I'm like ungrateful or taking it for granted it's just because if I had that kind of thing in my head then I would be completely stifled from any future work and I really don't want that yeah yeah no I get that we got some interesting questions from someone who's doing a master's in English literature at uh, Mary I and um, they're doing their thesis on representations of unhealthy relationships in Irish women's contemporary fiction. And there's a chapter that's dedicated to exciting times. Um, so they sent in a couple of questions, um, quite specific ones. So first one is, Ava questions her position as a feminist while also allowing Julian to pay for her livelihood, a sort of kept woman. Does this signify an unhealthy relationship? Could it be considered unfeminist? What do you think of her position? Um, and there's a quote from in the book, why shouldn't he take care of it? Maybe it made me a bad feminist. Do you have any kind of general comment, I guess, on that, on that relationship dynamic between them? Well, first of all, it's so cool that I'm being written about in a thesis. So <laughs> thank you for that. But um, yeah, I suppose my aim with Ava's narrative voice, including when she pondered such issues, was to have an immediacy and an intimacy that would foreclose my having an obvious authorial take. I never wanted readers to feel that I was giving them my cliff notes on how to interpret Ava. I wanted it to feel like she was talking directly to them. And that's part of why she ponders contradictory things that don't fit well together, because that's the reality of the inside of most people's minds. However collected we seem in our ideology, it's the result of a lot of back end work where we try to reconcile things. But I, I mean, I suppose my personal take on that kind of thing is that a politics that doesn't defer back to material reality is kind of useless. It doesn't really matter what she thinks of herself or what she believes the narrative is. It's about what position these people are in as a result of their relation to capital ultimately which is fixed so mm. and, and I think that's maybe the underpinnings of why she ultimately dismisses the question quite glibly because she's like things aren't going to change even if my feelings change yeah yeah true um there's a question about um Edith's name um is there a reasoning behind giving Edith's full name, but not Ava's or Julian's? Yes, completely. I wanted Ava and Julian to be um, 
I suppose is shown through their names as existing in this isolated expat bubble, not meaningfully connected to the local community, nor meaningfully connected to the past lives that they had in Europe where a surname would pertain. So, yeah. yeah. And likewise, is there a reasoning behind the lack of coming out on the part of Ava? Well, it depends on what you mean by coming out, like to everyone or to some people, because she does come out to some yeah, people. Yeah, I guess like, it's it's I, a reading of it too, isn't it? It's like the their perspective, obviously, from reading it is sort of a hesitancy around, yeah, maybe coming out in, like on a grand scale, Nisha. Yeah, um, I just thought it wouldn't make sense for her character too, because we've seen the circumstances that she's in and yeah. I didn't want to, I suppose, make it a coming out story, which it would have to be because it's established that she's an emotionally repressed character who has not yet fully done so. Like it, it's quite difficult to have someone who's shown to have such difficulties in the first place casually do it. It would take over the story, I think. But it, that wasn't like an act of a conscious decision on my part. It was just, I didn't choose to write that kind of book. Yeah, and I and I guess maybe it's it's a sort of a, an assumption too, because she's a queer character that like she has to have this moment. Whereas, like you say, it made sense to you that this is the character. So this is is how it happened. But I guess we're still kind of getting used to like representations of queer people in fiction and what they do or don't do. And maybe part of their story is coming out and maybe it's not, or maybe the nature of how that happens. It's, it's still all very relevant to who they are. It's not their sexual, um, sexual right. orientation. Yeah. And like, that's why I was completely adamant that Ava is not meant to represent any queer person because you can't do that we're as complex as straight people and therefore no one will speak for the entire experience like I think for me the thing about representation is it needs to be a varied menu there's never going to be one item on that menu that will suit everyone because we all have our miscellaneous intolerances and preferences yeah um the the last question that kind of came in from that person is is Ava an antagonist in her own story Yes, completely. The conflict is almost entirely internal. There are moments when both of the lovers give her ultimatums and prods, but I absolutely did not want to write a novel about two people fighting over the love of the main character. Because that's just like, why don't you all sit down and talk? I wanted a character whose confliction gets at the heart of who they are. So yeah, she completely messes things up for herself on basically every page until the end. There's some general questions, I guess, about the book that might have long or short answers. You know, they're a bit general, so ask, answer them how you please, I guess. What inspired you to write Exciting Times? Nothing, really. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm quite pragmatic about writing. I'm just like, I would like to produce something the following length. Now, how do I fill it? So, yeah, I just gave it a go, I guess. You know, I was just out of college. I was just messing around. Um, a couple of questions came in around kind of the process of, of getting published and just how that was for you. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about that, about, you know, finding an agent or the, the road to publishing as you discovered it, whatever you're happy to share. Yeah, so um, I wrote the book and then I left it for ages because I just had so much other work to do and... I wasn't, I suppose, aiming for anything with it. So then eventually I came to editing it and then um, a friend asked to publish a bit of it in his journal and then an agent contacted me having seen it in that journal. And I actually didn't end up going with that agent because they advised me to query other people too, which is such like nice, generous advice if you want to represent someone, but you're like, I don't want to just be the first agent who asked. So. I did that and I ended up going with another agent that I queried myself, just like completely cold in her inbox, um, Harriet, who is a, an absolute goddess and just the smartest person I've ever worked with. And then from there, um, Harriet and I did more edits on the book because we're still like extremely rough because I had written it a year ago then and hadn't looked at it much since. 
and then she sent it out later that year to publishers who started bidding for it and then after um, we decided which one to go with and um, the editor who made the decision to acquire it and um, became my editor and we did more edits then and then it went out great lovely really nice to know that Harriet was was so good in the process she obviously really liked the work and you obviously got on well which is I imagine is important yeah yeah like she's completely just it, she's there at every stage and it's just really nice having someone you trust I think there was a question about uh, cultures on the book. Exciting Times is set against a backdrop of different cultures, both Hong Kong and the socioeconomic status of the characters. What interests you more? How money affects our behaviour towards each other or how culture is affected by money? I think it's inextricable because culture consists of the people who produce and participate in it. So you can't isolate culture from society so I, I think I'm interested in where all those things intersect. There's a question about um, characters in the book and do you identify with any of them, with one of them, with certain traits of different ones? Um. Like, I, I suppose I wanted to create the impression that they were human, and I am also arguably human, so in that sense, um, I, yeah, I suppose there's a degree of sharing things, but to me it's just impossible to think of them as real people, because I've seen all the techie work that goes into producing them, I've seen how you edit one small thing about them and then they're completely different anyway, so uh, you know, when I read other people's books, the characters feel like real people, but that's because of how the author has gone about creating them. And on that same note, um, I can't read my own and feel that way, I guess. Yeah. Um, there was a, a question, I guess it kind of ties into that because it's just a general writing question about when did you start writing? And can you maybe talk a bit about your journey with writing just as a sort of a process maybe you know were you always kind of making notes like was it diary entries when you were younger like how did they how did it develop and, and was there kind of a turning point then when it maybe became craft or something else yeah so I didn't really write of my own volition until I was a teenager but um I I think kind of around my mid-teens I was just bored so you know I drew a lot I painted a lot I played the piano but also I wrote and age 16 I um, wrote a dreadful novel about three teenagers who go to the west of Ireland and take a load of drugs and thank god the file has perished because no one should be subjected to this <laughs> skinned fan fiction did it, make have, it like, Irish. did it have a title I just I want to know now did it have a, a title I can't remember the title but I think the title was um just one of the deep things that the characters said to each other while they were all baked and I just like made that the title it's it, so I, like I don't even the thing is I have such a good memory that I'm sure I have deliberately repressed this book because I can't bear to remember any more of it than that. <laughs> like you can see why so an unpromising start but you can also see why there are the bones in that of the kind of work that I will probably always yeah. produce I'll always be interested in taking two three or four people and having them in situations where they suddenly learn things about themselves I guess just like thank god that wasn't the first published novel um, <laughs> but yeah I suppose since then um I used to write plays a lot as well or just like random snippets of dialogue because I loved reading plays I, I think because I'm not much one for the out description if you've read my book you know what I mean so it, it's just like let's just skip the boring bits and just like let them talk in a room so yeah I, I just pottered away that kind of stuff on my own but I had no real external relationship to it like I never published anything and then in my final year of college, I did a few weeks of a creative writing module with Deirdre Madden, who is the best teacher and exactly the right one for me because she didn't have a romantic way of talking about writing at all. She wasn't like, find your voice. She was like, 
here's how to properly edit your work. And that was exactly what I needed because I think that way too. So then um, pretty much straight after that, like I left college that year and then I wrote Exciting Times and it's kind of the first big thing I've ever published. So that was my journey, I guess. Yeah, wow. that That's really interesting. I think it's kind of, it's mad too that you would have written a novel though when you're a teenager as well. Because like sometimes I teach creative writing to teenagers and sometimes someone shows up in the class and they've written like a whole book and I'm so impressed because like it's not an easy thing either you know it's something that maybe you would take for granted that to write at length you know and for no real reason not a reason at least that's given to you by another person you know so there there's obviously kind of an impulse there you know when I come across a young person who's doing that I'm kind of always you know quietly very impressed by them and that kind of work ethic I guess that they're showing. Yeah, I think as well, if you have a body of other work that's been well received, it's a lot more pressure on the novel then. Like I know so many excellent short story writers who just find their first novel a bit crippling because they're already recognised as a good short story writer. Whereas mm. I wasn't recognised as a good anything as a teenager, not even a good teenager. So like it was incredibly easy to just churn this thing out and, it, you know, no one would ever see it. And if they did, they would think no more poorly than they already did of me for being a massive emo who hated everything. So. <laughs> um, there's a question on art forms and your relationship to other art forms. I, I guess, you know, you mentioned your paintings earlier. After kind of literature and, and writing, would you have a kind of favourite or preferred art form? Or what is your engagement like with the other art forms? Yeah, it's definitely all linked for me. I think whenever I engage with another form of art, it informs the sensory element of my work, especially. I think the cognitive stuff is really where the novel is unique, right? That interiority, but all the other senses in it, you know, you have to get them across and it really helps to think about how people do it in other formats. So visual arts for sure. Um, music, definitely. There's such a mathematical rhythmic thing to music that I think has substantial overlaps with how to write good prose and even with the structuring of a plot arc right the same way a crescendo works within a bar and then within a movement and within an entire symphony like I, yeah I, I think there's a pacing and a build up and a letdown that all overlaps there and I love photography I have a couple of cameras that I love taking out and it's probably one of the things that I miss the most now not being able to responsibly get the tube all across London and photograph everything so yeah it's all linked. What music are you listening to at the moment? Um, so not to be an entire parody of myself but last night I listened to an entire Phoebe Bridges al album and just cried I can't even remember the name of the album like I get into stuff so much later than everyone else but then when I do all this pent up I need to get into this thing overwhelms me so um, that's my latest but um, for working I just listen to classical music because my writing tends to be quite dialogue heavy so I need to be able to hear the characters voices and I can't hear that on top of the bowed Phoebes so <laughs> um okay so you got some lovely I just want to mention because they're not really questions but you got some lovely comments and compliments too to your your shout out you definitely have some fans and people who like you out there uh Katerina in Portugal who says she really likes your style of humor and your new flat um I am finding myself in lockdown particularly getting to see people's interiors I guess you know because we're all kind of at home you see more of someone's interior um life and or at least you know what they're showing from it but um I think people have definitely been uh enjoying your um your sharings from the flat recently one question about kind of like classic books I know like you've studied literature but say with classic books and I'm get, I guess I'm talking about anything that might not be you know of the last 30 years um would you have gone through phases or times of reading uh say classic books before reading more contemporary stuff and and do you have any thoughts on like how that might shape kind of books for you or the world of writing like uh, I studied English in college too and like I discovered you know a lot of kind of classics and then stuff from different eras because I guess it's grouped thematically so then you kind of like 
if you choose to study English, you wind up learning about it through a lot of different lenses. And then I really enjoyed after graduating from college, just fully diving into like contemporary fiction because there hadn't really been much. There'd been like a few kind of seminars. You know, we did like I did a seminar where we did like White Teeth and uh, Louis de Bernier and a couple of kind of contemporary novelists. But most of it tended to be historical. So I guess like that distinction maybe between like contemporary very contemporary fiction and kind of older stuff like from studying and then post studying has your relationship with kind of what you've changed what you've read changed like um between what you used to read and what you would read now yeah i grew up mostly reading old books um just in terms of availability aside from anything else because it was what the library had and it was what was cheapest in shops and that probably shaped my approach in writing by grounding literature for me as something that isn't necessarily responding directly to what you see around you because it's uh, kind of hard for a Charlotte Bronte to do that in the 1840s to a Dubliner in the 2000s so then aside from anything else just because of supply and demand inevitably I had to start reading more contemporary literature later because you run out of good classics you don't run out of classics but you run out of ones that you know not have stood the test of time because lots of really good stuff gets for forgotten but you know there's a reason that a lot of them haven't stood the test of time so after I'd gone through most of the big names yeah I kind of had to start branching out and I definitely did that in college because we were assigned contemporary literature aside from anything else and I suppose reading now it yeah I'd move between the two and I still think the way that I read contemporary literature is informed by the fact that I started mostly with the classics because for me the mark of a good book isn't does it say something really pressing and specific to our exact era now? It's more, is it a good novel? And in practice, I think through writing a good contemporary novel, you often will respond to what you see around you because the kind of mind that's good at observing people and culture will also be sensitive to what's actually happening, right? But it's not the aim because I just feel like you can read a newspaper article instead of a novel if you want to find out about a social issue. Yeah true yeah totally true um there's a few kind of like questions i guess that might pertain to lockdown specifically or might generally be asked but um about kind of what you're you know consuming and like do you watch uh what are you watching on netflix is the question but i guess it could be anything could be prime or generally stuff i don't know if you're a, a box set girl or like what you watch but yeah um I don't subscribe to any streamers because I'm a cheapskate, but I really enjoyed It's a Sin on Channel 4 recently. Mm -hmm. It's about a bunch of teenagers in the 80s. And it's just like I, I was just crying and my flatmate was just holding me. And I'm just like, oh my God, it, it, this is so recent. And it's not that I hadn't processed all that history before, but just seeing it so authentically there. Eating, Nisha, like you've already said that you wouldn't really like to have dinner particularly with people but um is there a preferred type of food or what types of things do you like to eat um well I'm vegan but obviously nowadays that doesn't really circumscribe you that much but yeah I, I like fruit it's just really handy and you don't need to do any preparation um noodles I love Indian food my family's Indian so we end up um getting like onion badges and stuff a lot um yeah just I, i'm not super picky within veganism just whatever's there really a couple of questions isha on on new work i guess i know with new work you know you're obviously working on things and you may not want to say too much about about what that is but there's definitely curiosity i guess naturally about what you're working on so can you share something about what you're working on currently or maybe when people can expect to see a new published thing? In terms of novels, I'm editing the second one. And well, we now know it's set in London and it has a lot of the same dark humor, I suppose. Um, I, I think that's all I'm able to share right now on that. But yeah, I have some short pieces coming out soon. I tend to have a steady drip of those. Um, 
because I'm bad at saying no to commissions aside from anything else, but like they're enjoyable to do, obviously. And I'm actually, it was interesting what you said about introductions earlier, because I've written the introduction to a reissue that's coming out in January 2021 of Jane Bowles' Two Serious Ladies. Mm. And it, it's definitely a book that shaped how I write because Jane Bowles is a lot like me. She loves dialogue very obviously and at times seems to be treating the rest of the stuff as a vehicle for dialogue, which is completely how I think a lot of the time. So I had a lot of fun writing that. Amazing, that's great. Um, there's a question on adaptation and I guess you mentioned theatre earlier and writing scripts. Uh, the question is, would you like to see work of yours adapted for stage or screen? I, I don't know, um, are you currently working on any scripting, but there's a question on that. Um, well, the TV rights have been optioned, but um, I can't say anything more yet. Yeah, okay. Um, is there anything in terms of like literary adaptation, I guess, like movie wise that you've seen that you particularly liked? Literary adaptation? Not recently, but I'm really looking forward to the HBO adaptation of The Vanishing Half. They've just got this brilliant team behind it. I think the author Britt Bennett isn't writing, but just like the whole lineup looks absolutely gorgeous. And like it's HBO, so they're going to shoot it so sumptuously and it's such a good book so I'm really stoked for that they haven't announced a release yet but hopefully soon has lockdown changed your relationship with travel as in future journeys um I suppose not really because I didn't fly before lockdown so like to the degree that people are reflecting on that I kind of already did that I guess but it, it has changed my conviction I suppose that I need to never fly 100% of the time because I've just seen now that most people being forced to do that has had absolutely no impact and like it, it's not that I thought that it would before but just like having that concretely established just makes it harder to feel that conviction 100%. So I think probably in future, if there's something that I might need to fly for, but there's an extremely elaborate workaround by not flying, but I could instead fly and just like donate the time and money that the workaround would have taken to something that more obviously contributes to the various things, the flying harms, like I, I probably would consider doing that, I guess. Yeah, a lot of people have talked about that, about the carbon footprint thing and and like say people casually flying, I guess, particularly for things that maybe they won't know after this. Although I feel like everyone is also quite desperate to see, you know, a landscape or a place uh, that's not in our instance, at least like the the 5K. Do you have a bucket list destination that you ever fantasize about? Rome because my Italian publisher wanted to have me over in October and like it was so late before we all had to accept that it couldn't happen because things had been simmering down but it wasn't possible in the end and like I've been to Rome before and I just love it so I really want to go back when things are over and you know say thank you to all these lovely Italians who published me. Well, it's been lovely to chat to you, Nisha. Thank you for doing this event with Ennis. It's been really nice to have you on and I appreciate it. Thank you, Danny.